Hello, I'm Manoj Kalmakar. Welcome to ISSPS TV. In this next video, Professor George Feigl from the University of Witten in Germany is going to be discussing with us the functional anatomy of the brachial plexus and common variations that are relevant for upper extremity brachial plexus block. If you like any of our videos, do remember to share and like it. Also do remember to subscribe so that you can get regular notifications of any future uploads. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much and dear audience and also colleagues. Um, I just want to give you a brief uh, overview about uh, the brachial plexus concerning uh, the topography and also certain different uh, structures which are very important for uh, block techniques in the area of the brachial plexus itself. Um, just briefly, a, a short repetition for you all um, concerning the different uh, parts of the brachial plexus, what you will uh, try to block uh, in the different uh, anatomical areas. So as you can see, first of all, uh, you get the ventral rami of the spinal nerves, then the trunks, uh, which divides into uh, cords, and then finally the nerves are formed, which are running to the uh, distal parts of the lower li upper limb. Um, and this is a, a very important thing concerning also the um, terminology, because uh, very often it's called root, uh, which is not that correct from the anatomical point of view because the roots are more centrally so in the spinal uh, canal and not in the area of um, the interscaline gap sorry for, george as an can example. you please uh, use the slideshow ah the slideshow oh. oh sorry yes of course <laughs> do so hope it should work yep Okay. Thank you. Does it work? Yeah, sorry. Um, and for the next, uh, you can see that the, you find, that first of all, have these um, ventral rami, which are regularly uh, found in the interscaline gap. So where you block, uh, you perform the interscaline block, you get this uh, ventral rami. Then they are dividing into the different trunks uh, where you can perform the superclavicular blocks and uh, continuing with the formation of the cords, uh, which is already infraclavicularly. And then finally in the axillary fossa in a, a very huge space, uh, which is uh, determined uh, by the uh, deep axillary fascia, as we will see a little bit later on, uh, you have this axillary brachial plexus blocks to be performed over there. Uh, and in this axillary fossa, you can see uh, the cords are already dividing into the different nerves, which are running distally and uh, innovating different areas and muscle groups. So if we can uh, make an image, for example, this is a topographical uh, dissection, um, which is also with an abducted arm, where you can see the formations of the different areas. And the first line is uh, the level of the clavicle, the second line of the lesser uh, uh, pectoral muscle, uh, pectoralis minor. And then you can see over here, this is uh, the formation of the trunks, um, where you get the ventral rami passing uh, the interscaline gap, then forming the trunks, and then already forming under the clavicle the area of the cords, which are dividing later on in the axillary fossa into the nerve fibers. Um, this is a systematical dissection, which means you can see all the different nerve fibers, but you can already see there are um, very, very huge connections and uh, fine connections in between the different nerve structures, uh, which is also very important that you get so many different variations concerning the brachial plexus itself. So you get these four regions, and I want to give a short overview uh, of each of them um, to um, start with the interscaline gap. Before, again, with uh, the 
uh, clerical is still in place and also the pectoral is minor, you can see the different areas which has to be passed by the brachial plexus parts. So the interscaline gap, which is really a narrow gap and uh, not very much space for any structure uh, being in there, are also uh, continuing with the supraclavicular region, which is also the so-called uh, posterior triangle of the neck. Then you get now the interscaline gap. Uh, this is, um, as you can see again, this narrow gap in between, where is uh, soft connective tissue in, inside and in between, and you can see already different uh, arteries and uh, well passing along. As you can see, for example, here, the dorsal scapular artery, for example, which is um, originating from the subclavian artery, um, lateral to the interscaline gap. Regularly, it uh, should uh, originate from a trunk, which is medial to the uh, anterior scalene muscle, which can be seen over here. Uh, and there are also some other arteries, like here, this, this is the superficial cervical artery, which is superficial to the so-called pre fascia, which you will see a little bit later on. And also uh, here dorsally, you can see the separate nerves, which are piercing the uh, middle scalene muscle uh, to, to reach the lateral part of the thorax, for example, which is the longest um, call, um the long thoracic nerve as an example. Um, anyway, this is uh, just um, an image with, with certain structures missing. And this is a very important information for you because um, the first of all, we have to talk about the structures which are also limiting and also uh, ordering the entire space where you find the brachial plexus itself. So first of all, about the pre fascia to give you some uh, important information and also the so-called pre space. Um, then a short contribution concerning is the fascia underneath. Uh, so just around, for example, the brachial plexus parts. And uh, then a very important also discussion, which is still ongoing, where uh, there's a, a local anesthetic which is injected underneath this pre vertebral fascia uh, is spreading to, is running to. And of course, uh, one of the most important things for us that we can also publish about is, of course, the uh, variations which are found over there and which can be a little bit irritating for you uh, performing ultrasound. So let's talk about the pre vertebral fascia. I just want to give you an impression how also uh, some images which can be found in uh, textbooks for regional anesthesia can be wrong. And this is something what you, what you always have to um, uh, think about and question. Uh, are the images what you see are really correct? Uh, for example, this image over here, wonderful, nice image, wonderful drawing, but uh, with some small errors in it. First of all, you get too many uh, contributions to the brachial plexus. You get six instead of five. So you get one too, too many. Uh, the second thing is, uh, for example, that you have the accessory in, uh, phrenic nerve, which is passing dorsally to the anterior scalene muscle. This is impossible. Uh, the next thing is uh, the rib. This is not the first rib, this is a second rib because the first rib is more flat and also um, really uh, giving a um, enough space for the brachial plexus, for the infrared trunk and also for the uh, subclavian artery and vein to pass uh, cranial to it. And most important, you can see over here this uh, was fascial tube um, which is passing underneath the clavicle and is continuing from maybe the epineurium. And this is wrong. This is absolutely wrong. This should be a fascia which is covering the scalene muscles. And this is something what you have also always have to question, uh, especially that you get a very, very uh, unique and wrong uh, anatomical um, overview. Um, and also, you cannot explain different spreads, for example. So 
what about this prevertebral fascia? You can see this prevertebral fascia in the dissection over here, which is a dense connective tissue layer uh, and also covering a, sec a second nerve, which is coming or arising, uh, arriving from the uh, cervical plexus, which is the phrenic nerve. And you get also contributions from the brachial plexus, as for example, C5 segment, which is giving some uh, nerve fibers to the phrenic nerve also. Um, and underneath this prevertebral fascia, you find the narrow space, which is filled now with the brachial plexus, all the connective tissues, and also different arteries and so on, um, which are in this space. So the space is already almost filled up. You have to consider this if you inject high volumes, as an example. Fortunately, with ultrasound, you decrease the volume. Uh, and this is a very important thing uh, that you also decrease the, uh, the risk of not welcome spread. Uh, if you now elevate the, uh, this fascia, you can see the space and the brachial plexus, which is uh, covered by this uh, epineural sheets and they are always uh, already spreading. And the phrenic nerve, which is running along the anterior uh, scalene muscle to reach the th thoracic cage. If we take now um, a cross section, um, at level at about C6, C5, um, C6, C7, now you can see over here, these are already the structures of the brachial plexus, so the ventral rami running laterally. And you see the epineural sheets just as, um, around with not very much space for the nerve fibers in, underneath this epineural sheet. But what is more important is that you can see this is a space which is continuing medially into the can uh, spinal canal, which means that you get the prevertebral space um, as a continuation medially into the epidural space directly. If we take um, another cross section and then make an elevation, you can see over here, these are now the ventral rami of the brachial plexus and just beside, just directly beside, this is the phrenic nerve, which is now marked with a yellow arrow. This close relationship is uh, really the high risk that if you get a cranial spread, um, you really uh, are risk um, you have a high risk to reach or to block the phrenic nerve additionally. Um, if we make now a, um, a so-called sagittal, sagittal section, you can see now the anterior scalene muscle um, running distally. And over here, the, this is here, sorry. Uh, and the anterior scalene muscle with the uh, interscalene gap. And you see, this is not very much space in between because it's the first rib and the subclavian artery. If we take a second uh, image, you see the prevertebral fascia with the anteroscaline muscle being covered by it. And over here, the brachial plexus parts with also the middle scalene muscle and then muscular um, well, bridges, uh, which are developed in between the middle and the anteroscaline muscle. And these can um, cause a confusion because regularly there should be nothing in between artery and brachial plexus, but sometimes you get hypoechogene um, uh, structures, which might be these muscle bridges. If we elevate now the uh, prevertebral fascia, you can see the phrenic nerve, which is covered by this fascia or being inside of this fascia. So any spread, which is medially and anterior or, or cranially might reach this nerve, uh, of course. If we take now again a cross section, you can see again this prevertebral fascia with this distinct dense connective tissue layer and the brachial plexus underneath. And you can see again the epineural sheets, but no fascias which are surrounding these nerve fibers. So this is not an additional fascia or a fascia which is covering the anterior or middle scalene muscle, but you get this space with dense connective tissues formed maybe by the epineural sheet, but I uh, hope you, we can hear it later on by the histolo histological um, uh, investigations. 
Another uh, cross section, which is now enlarged, you can see again the prevertebral fascia with the phrenic nerve. And let's take a look on this close relation uh, in between the super trunk, and this is the C7 segment, which will form uh, the middle trunk. And again, also over here, the mid anterior and middle scalene muscle with the muscle bridges, which can divide uh, these um, trunk parts um, from each other. So, Regarding now the spread, you have to take into consideration that any injection underneath the prevertebral fascia might be uh, or might continue uh, with a medial spread. And the medial spread can be now uh, reach the, the epidural, space, uh, epidural space in the spinal canal, but it also might uh, pass behind the anterior scalene muscle medi medially uh, into the so called scalene vertebral triangle or in, into the mediastine uh, to reach the aortic arch as an example. So this is a very important thing that you uh, can explain later on also some side effects like the hoarseness, uh, which is caused by the block of the um, re recurrent laryngeal nerve as an example, or the Horner syndrome, which is uh, caused by a block of the sympathetic trunk and the sympathetic trunk parts are found in, in the uh, uh, scalene vertebral triangle. So what about now variations? Oh, well, they're quite common. Uh, as an example, the uh, scalenus minimus muscle, described long, long time ago. Um, and you can see over here, as an example, one of these dissections where the brachial plexus is uh, separated from the subclavian artery by a distinct muscle which is reaching the uh, pleural dome. And if you find such a muscle, again, with a lateral view with the pleural dome, um, you have an hypoechogene hypo um, structure in between the artery and the brachial plexus dorsally. If you get a hyperechogene structure, um, well, the muscle is replaced by a ligament, as we'll see later on. And these ligaments are quite, quite known. They are known since more than 170 years. Uh, they are called the tucacandal sabilo ligaments, which are, are fixing the pleural dome to the bony parts. And one of these is, for example, the costopleura vertebral ligament, which is, if is it developed as a ligament, um, called costopleura vertebral ligament. If it's a muscle, it's the scalenus minimus, nothing else. So quite well known, and they are very frequent. As again, you can see these muscle fibers, muscle bridges, which are in between the middle and the anterior scalene muscle, quite common. And these frequent, um, they, you get a frequency of about 40% of this uh, connections in between these muscles because they are developing from the same myotome. As you, can, as you saw it just before, you have these muscle bridges in here. Okay, if you get the pyrus in, the, uh, in between, for example, the superior trunk and the C7 or the middle trunk, this might be an, an artery which is passing and running uh, dorsally, which is the dorsal scapular artery. Quite a common one and also quite frequent uh, in about 30% uh, to be found in this area. So let's go now continue with the posterior triangle of the neck. You get the superclavicular blocks over there, as you can see. And now here, this uh, variation with the artery passing in between the super and the middle trunk. This is the um, dorsal uh, scapular artery. And you can see over here, this is the uh, superficial cervical artery, which has a close relationship, which can be seen quite easily in ultrasound, of course. But uh, this is uh, separated by the prevertebral fascia, so it's not in the same space. As you can see it over here, this is the prevertebral fascia still uh, being in, this, in its place. You see the brachial plexus passing underneath and the uh, superficial cervical artery running laterally to reach the trapezius muscle. It's a little bit enlarged. And uh, the question arises now, well, if we get now a shoulder block, for example, in this area, are we safe? Do we have, do, do we get everything? 
And the answer, unfortunately, is no, because uh, the superclavicular nerves are missing because they are superficial to the uh, brachial plexus and also superficial to the prevertebral fascia. So as you can see it over here again, with a lateral view now with the prevertebral fascia and the uh, middle scalene muscle and the brachial plexus, um, with the next image, you can see from a cranial view, the prevertebral fascia and the supraclavicular nerves would be superficial to it. So if you want to have a shoulder block, you sh still have to think and to take into consideration to take this trunk of the supraclavicular nerves to also block the innervation of the skin area in the shoulder region. And this is quite easy because uh, if you go cranially with your probe, you find the trunk passing and piercing uh, the prevertebral fascia just at level at, um, well, C5. Um, and then you get really a very uh, distinct block over there with a low volume of about one milliliter, not more. And you get a wonderful block of the entire trunk to get a safe uh, block and uh, of the shoulder region. Another variation, which is not that often, but uh, quite, quite, un uh, well, unusual, is the ribs of the neck which can entirely change your topography in the area of the uh, superclavicular region and also of the interscaline gap. And the longer this uh, neck rib is, you can see the more this will change your entire uh, visibility and also entire images, imaging of uh, this area. Additionally, you find Another muscular regions, especially in the lateral triangle of the neck or posterior triangle of the neck, which are formed by muscles uh, coming from the deep and reaching su uh, superficial muscles like the sternocleidomastoid. And these are quite common and also quite frequent because again, you get these uh, muscle bridges up by the development. Uh, this is for example, a clado, uh, clavicular muscle or um, atlantoclavicular muscle, for example, um, okay, let's go to the deltoid uh, pectoral groove, which is also called the Morenheim grooves, uh, where you can uh, find underneath the continuation of the prevertebral fascia, which is the clavipectoral fascia, then the, um, the cords of the brachial plexus, uh, just located lateral to the subclavian artery. And which is most important is that you have the uh, the cords formed and also positioned um, that you find the lateral cord as the most ventrally and lateral one then you have the posterior cord uh, which is a little bit dorsal lateral and dorsal to the artery is always the medial cord um, this is caused by um, well, let's say the direction the um, medial cord is formed. Uh, and this is a continuation of the inferior trunk by the ventral uh, part of ventral division of the inferior trunk. So there's it's not much space um, for the medial trunk to get more medially. So at the area or at the level of the infraclavicular uh, region, you have the medial cord dorsally to it. Again, I just want to um, give you a very important um, publication, which is of Abraham Kerr. And Abraham Kerr uh, investigated about 220 brachial plexus, and he found 140 uh, variations. So if you see more than three nervous structures uh, in this area, you get a variation. Because you are always thinking about, ah, there have to be three. No. There can be more and there can be less. So you have just to um, um, visualize the nerve structure and to go on it and to, uh, to reach it with your needle. The problem is that if you go underneath, yeah, you have the pectoral muscle, you have the deltoid muscle, you have the cephalic vein, then uh, this groove, this distinct groove where you can continue and you have this lesser pectoral muscle or the pectoralis minor, this clavipectoral fascia, and then you go underneath 
this fascia and you have the brachial plexus dorsal to the artery, as you can see it over here. It's the subclavian muscle in the, in the sagittal section with uh, the clavicle and the vein. And then a space which is continuing dorsally. And this is a very important information that uh, if the needle is placed not in the proper position, you get a, a spread dorsally and will not reach, for example, the inferior trunk or the medial cord as an example. We can see also this continuation of the epineural sheets forming already, uh, already so-called fascial tunnels in this area. And again, the dorsally located um, space. So if the needle is placed too, de too deep, you get the spread dorsally and it will not reach any uh, area, um, for example, such the medial cord. So if you inject or perform, for example, the, uh, the so-called uh, whip, which is the vertical infraclavicular block, um, this might be the risk. And therefore it's quite um, useful for example, like the, the costal clavicular uh, block, which is uh, while well, reaching really the entire area quite easily. Okay, let's go finally to the axillary fossa. Um, in this axillary fossa, uh, you find, of course, the so-called nerve structures uh, also while well, be being accompanied by the artery and also the vein, the coracobrachialis muscle which is a very important landmark in your ultrasound image. And of course, the um, greater muscles like the uh, uh, pectoralis major and also the latissimus dorsi muscle. Um, in this axillary fossa, you get now the final division of the cords into the nerves. And you know that, uh, for example, from the lateral uh, cord, you get the musculocutaneous nerve. And this is already the bad boy in this area. Uh, additionally, you get the ulnar nerve uh, from the medial cord and from the posterior cord, the radial and the axillary nerve, where the axillary nerve might not be reached in all uh, your block techniques. More important is that you find over there so uh, a fascia which is covering the entire brachial plexus. This is the so-called deep axillary fascia. And if you insert the needle, you get uh, this deep axillary space and the deep ax axillary space is a continuation of uh, the space underneath the uh, clavipectoral fascia and therefore of the uh, prevertebral fascia. So in common, you get the same space underneath the deep axillary fascia, which is continuing to the interscaline gap and continues also into the epidural space. But you get the deep axillary fascia, which is also dividing the deep axillary space with the brachial plexus underneath and the so-called subfascial axillary space. Why do, I, why do I say this? Oh, well, there is a nerve which is running distally, which has to be considered uh, to be blocked for especially medial, um, well, medial surgical uh, procedures at the elbow joint. And this is the so-called intercostal brachial nerve. Well, let's talk about the deep axillary space. This is the deep axillary space. And it was said to be, okay, if we, we go underneath this fascia, we get an entire spread around all these nerves. Unfortunately, uh, this is not that true because um, as I already talked about the epineural sheets, which are, which are dividing and they can form really so-called um, connections in between each uh, sheet, each epineural sheet, and therefore forming some, some uh, tissue layers, which are like walls in between the different nerves. So if you uh, put the needle just, let's say, on the median nerve, um, it might not spread dorsally because there are distinct walls in between. And this is the so-called subaxillary, uh, subfascial axillary space with the lymph nodes inside and then the uh, so-called intercostal brachial nerve, which is passing. Okay, over here, um, so-called uh, 
transverse section with the axillary artery and you can see the nerve fibers and this is the deep axillary fascia over here. Again, the deep axillary fascia with the nerve fibers and you can see even distinct over here some uh, well dense connective tissues which are forming real tunnels in between and then which is not visible but hopefully might be uh, visible someday by histological sections, um, these interconnections in between. So what are the bad boys now? I'm just almost finished. You get the musculocutaneous nerve as an example with uh, which might have a so-called high origin. And if you perform over here your brachial plexus block, it might not reach the nerve. So it's quite easy to get him in the area or directly in the muscular, um, sorry, in the coracobrachial cor muscle. Uh, but anyway, you might not reach the axillary nerve, which is more uh, proximal. So you can see this is a, a really a, a problem, but it can be uh, performed, for example, if you move the probe more proximal and then get it uh, in the quadrangular space, as an example. And the intercostal brachial nerve, you can see over here, this is a nerve which has to be blocked separately. Uh, and then if you go underneath this, uh, this uh, deep axillary fascia, you, might re you will reach the intercostal brachial separately in the subaxillary space, superficial axillary space. Okay, other variations is this high origin of the musculocutaneous which is not that problem because the visibility of the nerve in the coracobrachial um, muscle is quite easy. But anyway, also some others are the lungus arch, arches, which are um, so so-called muscular bridges, uh, which are coming from uh, the greater pectoral muscle or from the latissimus dorsi to each other. So from the latissimus dorsi to the um, greater pectoral muscle, you find these muscular bridges, and they are also hypoechogene uh, structures which are crossing directly. And just have one image over here, like this from the from the greater pectoral to the latissimus dorsi, or other way around. You have these very irritating uh, structures which might cross in this area where you perform the axillary brachial plexus block. Okay, so from my point of view, I hope I, give, I gave you. A a short overview about different variations and uh, important structures which has to be considered and thank you very much for your attention.